Hello everybody, it's Mr. Yosef, and this is review homework number one. We're gonna try to do some EOC review along with review, or actually we're not actually reviewing, just learning how to do trig. So this first question was kind of similar to our benchmark. It says, what is the remainder uh, when taking this polynomial and dividing it by x minus five? So there's two ways to do it. I'm gonna show you the way that's easier to remember, and then I'm gonna show you the way that's quicker. So let's just start with like division. So when you have division, there's two ways to divide. You can take x minus 5 and do 5x cubed minus 22x squared minus 17x plus 11 and divide this way. This is like your traditional way of dividing. You would highlight both terms, like x and 5x cubed. x times what gives me 5x cubed? Well, that's just 5x squared. You take 5x squared and you multiply it by each term. So 5x squared times x is 5x cubed. 5x squared times negative 5, that's negative 25x squared. And then we're going to subtract going down. So 5x cubed minus 5x cubed is 0. Negative 22x squared minus minus 25x squared that will be 3x squared. We drop negative 17x, and we do this process again, this time highlighting 3x squared, okay? So x times what gives me 3x squared? Well, that's 3x. Then you're gonna take the 3x, sorry, let me erase this real quick. Nope, nope. Okay, then you're gonna take the 3x and you're gonna multiply it by the two terms. So 3x times 3x is 3x squared. 3x times negative five, that's negative 15. Put in parentheses, subtract. Negative 17x minus minus 15, that is negative 2x, drop plus 11. Highlight negative 2x, do the process again. x times what gives me negative 2x. That's just going to be a negative 2. And then we're going to take negative 2 and multiply the first 2. Negative 2 times x is negative 2x. Negative 2 times negative 5, that's plus 10. Put this in parentheses, put a subtraction sign outside. Um, negative 2x minus minus 2x, that's 0. I kind of skipped that step earlier too. Like the first ones always go away. And then 11 minus 10 is 1. And because you're left with a number alone, this is called the remainder. So this is doing a process with long division. As you can see, it was a little long, right? But this is a safe way to do it. If you want to do it a different way, we could do it with synthetic division. So synthetic division is when you take x minus 5, you set that equal to 0, and you get the number 5. You take the number 5 outside, you make your little L, and then you take the coefficients. So you would write 5, negative 22, negative 17, and 11. You drop 5. Then you do 5 times 5, which gets you 25. And then you add going down, which gives you 3. And then you do 3 times, then you do 3 times 5, which gives you 15. You add, that gives you negative 2. Then you take negative 2, multiply by the 5 outside, that gets you negative 10, and then 11 plus negative 10 is just 1. And do we see that this number is also our remainder and our final answer? So when something is set up like this, synthetic division is always nice. But there is one more way that is easier than both of these ways, and this one way shows like the deepest understanding of remainders. So I'm going to erase all this and show you that real quick. So the last... And final way to do this same problem is understanding that you can just 
Once again, take x minus 5, set it equal to 0, and you're going to get x equals 5. So if x equals 5 is a solution to this polynomial, when I take 5 and I substitute it into the function, I should get the number 0. Because if I get the number 0, that tells me that the remainder is 0. If I don't get 0, the number that you get is just called your remainder. So for this problem, all you have to do is plug in 5. And when you plug in 5, everybody, believe it or not, you're going to get the number 1. And this is called your remainder. All right, I did that pretty fast, so I want you to think about it, but I just showed you three ways to do the same problem. As you can see, this last one is definitely the easiest one just because it's quick, especially if you're taking a test. All right? Number two, it says what values of x makes this equation true? Do not forget about extraneous solutions. So when I see a problem like this, it seems to me that you would just cross multiply, right? So we could do that, but for this one, I'm going to show you why I'm not. So I'm going to do 2 times x squared minus 4 equals 4 times x plus 2. And do you see how I get 2x squared minus 8 equals 4x plus 8? This looks like a factoring problem. I'm going to have to move everything to the left side and factor. So I could do it. Like we could subtract 4x and subtract x on both sides. And if we do that, we get 2x squared minus 4x minus 16 equals 0. And we can go and we can factor this. So we can factor out a 2. And then 2 times y gives me 2x squared, x squared. 2 times y gives me negative 4x, negative 2x. 2 times y gives me negative 16, negative 8. Set that equal to 0. If I want to solve for x, I could just divide both sides by 2. So now I get x squared minus 2x minus 8 equals 0. And then I'm factoring this. What two numbers multiply to negative 8 and add to negative 2? Well, that's going to be negative 4 and plus 2. I'm going to take each factor and set it equal to 0. And you're going to get x equals 4 and x equals negative 2. But remember at the beginning, I gave you a hint. Do not forget about extraneous solutions. I don't know if you noticed, but negative 2 is a bad value. Because if you plug in negative 2 here, does everybody see that 2 over negative 2 plus 2? is 2 over 0. Having a 0 on the bottom is bad because it makes the function undefined. So you always have to check to make sure that the number that you get does not make your denominator 0. So this is one way to do this problem. Once again, if you're not the biggest fan of factoring, I can see why this doesn't appeal to you. So let's do it another way. So the other way is nice. So what we're going to do is your goal is you're going to make the denominators the same. Does everybody see how this is x plus 2 and this is x squared minus 4? I don't know if you noticed this, but x squared minus 4 is just x minus 2 and x plus 2. So do we see that both sides has x plus 2 and x plus 2? So what we're going to do is I'm going to write in pink the original. And I'm going to multiply the 1 to the left by x minus 2 because what I'm trying to do here, everybody, is I want to make the denominators the same. So do you see by multiplying the left one by x minus 2 in the denominator and the numerator, both the denominators now are the same. And when both denominators are the same, you're allowed to multiply both sides by the denominator and it gets rid of it. So all you're left with is 2 times x minus 2 equals 4. And if you solve this, add 4, and you get 4. Do you see how this method just gave us the answer right away? And we avoided the extraneous solution. You can still check, right? You still should plug in 4 
and make sure it doesn't give you zero on the bottom. In this case, it doesn't. So this is a really nice way to do this as well. All right, let's move on to three. So number three, these are the questions that are not hard, but they just look weird and they're asked in a really strange way. So let's read it, make sure we understand it. What is the value of a when we rewrite four to the power of 31x as a to the power of x? So when I see this a, everybody, it seems to me that this x on the top, they want the x by itself. And my issue here is beside the x, we have a 31. So we want to rewrite it pretty much like this. We want an equivalent statement that will give us this, but we want x to be by itself. So I don't know if you see it, everybody. You just do 4 to the power of 31. Because the exponent rule says if it's a power power rule, these two multiply each other. So does everybody see that 31 times x is just 31x? So we just rewrote this in a way that's equivalent, but we did what they wanted. So that's why the answer is 4 to the power of 31. You're pretty much just using this exponent rule. Uh, let me write it like this. I don't know if y'all remember this rule. That's just a times b. So this, we're going from here and then going like that. All right? So with multiple choice, I feel like I wouldn't be concerned as much because I feel like you'll be able to get this. But this is still a good question that could be uh, non-multiple choice. So let's get to number four, because number four is kind of equivalent, but it's, it's, it's a little bit more difficult. So here we want to find the same thing. We want to make one over seven to the power of x, but now it got interesting. So we need to find out an a value to the power of nine, negative nine x, that's going to produce this right here. So we want to produce this, but do you see here, everybody, we have this. So that's going to be interesting to get rid of. So when you first look at this problem, the problem is negative 9. So if I want to get rid of negative 9 as an exponent, I think it makes sense to multiply by negative 1 9th. Because negative 1 9th times negative 9, everybody, is just 1. So if negative 9 was my issue, do you see that by multiplying by negative 1 over 9, it's going to get rid of it? And then you could just make 1 over 7 your base. Because now when you multiply these two, you're going to end up with 1 to the power of 7 to the power of x, which is what you want. So once again, this problem looks really random. It looks really weird. But the issue here was negative 9. So in order to get rid of the power of negative 9, you need to multiply by a power of negative 1 ninth because that produces 1. And then you have to put 1 7 as your base because that's what we want to do. And so that's why our answer here should be C. Because I'm going to highlight this in pink. This part now, everybody, that's my A. And do we see that? Matches that. All right. Now to trick. Fun, fun. All right. Let's do this. So, sine of 60. So if I draw 60 degrees, bam, bam, 60, this is 90. And you need to look at your notes. So if this is 60, you should know that on the unit circle, the hypotenuse is 1. Opposite of 60 is square root of 3 over 2. And then on top of here is 30. So opposite to that is 1 half. So for doing sine of 60, the definition of sine is opposite divided by hypotenuse or just the y value. So when I look at opposite of 60, I see that it's square root of 3 over 2 divided by 1. So that's the square root of 3 over 2. And we're done with that one. So once again, in your notes, you should have this triangle already drawn. And all we're doing is sine, which is just our y value, which is like the height, or just opposite over hypotenuse. So now the next ones are a little bit more confusing because we are going beyond 90 degrees. So let's draw this. So 120. 
So 120 looks like this. But remember that when we want to find out what's sine of 120, we need to draw a right triangle. So we want to make the right triangle that is closest to the, the closest x-axis. So do you see that if you're right here, that this x-axis is the closest? So you're going to go down and create a triangle. In this degree that's made over here, it's 60. So the reference angle for 120 is 60. So you want to make triangles are either 45, 60, or 30, even though we are beyond 90. So do you see that if you have 120, we made our triangle because 120 is 60 away from our x-axis. So we're gonna make this square root of three over two because this is opposite of 60. This is 90, so this is one. The only one difference this, this time is we're gonna make this one negative half. And the reason why it's negative half is because we're in quadrant two. And in quadrant two, your x values are negative and your y values are positive. So this negative half on the bottom is our x value. So since we're doing cosine of 120 degrees, that is adjacent over hypotenuse or our x value. And does everybody see that adjacent to 60 is negative half? And if we divide that by one, which is our hypotenuse, we get negative half. So that's why this is a negative half. Okay? So remember, even though it's 120, the only things that are different is you need to look at the signs, depending on what quadrant you're in, and you need to draw a triangle according to how far away your angle is from the closest x-axis, which you'll get to see examples because I'm going to do more of those. So let's do 240 and draw that and see how you feel about that. So 240. So just to give you some reference, everybody, this is 0 degrees, 90 degrees, 180, 270. So 240 is like I'm going like this. So this path over here is 240. But remember, the weird thing is when you want to draw your triangle or your reference angle to help you, if 240 is down here, you actually have to go up to make your triangle because the closest x-axis is up, right? Not to the right. And also, let me draw this 240 again to make it look like 240 because sometimes my degrees, there we go. So now, everybody, I want you to focus on the triangle that is made in quadrant three. So do you see that this part right here, this is our reference angle. So how far is 180 from 240? That's just 60 degrees. So that's 60, 90, and this is 30. And you're going to look at it from the perspective of 60 degrees. So once again, opposite of 60 is square root of 3 over 2 but it's gonna be negative since we're in the third quadrant, and opposite to 30 is negative half because we're in the third quadrant. Quadrant three, everybody, is negative, negative. So now we're doing tangent. So tangent of theta means opposite divided by adjacent, or y divided by x. So opposite to 60 is square root of three over two, and we're gonna divide that by negative half. When you divide fractions, you need to multiply by the reciprocal. And as everybody see, if you do negative 2 divided by 2, those divide out. And you're left with negative square root of 3. And that is our answer. So I hope the triangles are making sense. Remember, 240 was right here. If you go this way, this is a y-axis, so that's bad. You want to go towards the closest x, which is here. So that's why we drew this line over here. All right, let's do 180. So 180 is called a quadrantal angle, and it's one of those weird ones that are like right over here. So when it's 180 degrees, you have to remember these points. So I don't know if y'all remember, this is one, zero, this is zero, one, this is negative one, zero, and this is zero, negative one. This is zero degrees, 90 degrees, and 270 degrees. So we're right here. So I told you that the definition of cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse or just your x value. 
So here we're just going to use our second definition because negative 1 is x and y is 0. So cosine of 180 degrees is just negative 1 because cosine is just our x value, and that's how quick and nice that is. So just remember, the weird angles are 0, 90, 180, and 270. You just have to remember these coordinate points. All right, last one, everybody. Let's do 225. So 225, the cool thing about 225 is if it has a 5, most likely the reference angle is always going to be 45 degrees. So if we go, once again, this is 180, everybody. 270, so 225 is like halfway. 225, so I'm tracing 225, but remember, if 225 is right here, we wanna go to the closest x-axis, which is above. So how far is 180 from 225? That makes this 45 degrees. Does everybody see that I'm highlighting the pink to show you the triangle that we're focused on? This bottom is 45. And if you look at your notes, you should know that it's square root of 2 over 2. And both of them are negative again because we are in the third quadrant. The definition of tangent, once again, is opposite over adjacent. So tangent of 225 is negative square root of 2 over 2 divided by negative square root of 2 over 2 which just equals 1, because if you divide two of the same numbers, you get the number 1. So I know I did that quickly, but it was a lot of info, so I just wanted to kind of help you and just give you some hints while you're doing your homework. All right, hope that helps. See you in the next one.